Hello and welcome to another edition of Fides Podcast. My name is Jerry Serino and I'm your host and I'm here with talent on loan from Rush. Hey, we have been talking and hearing a lot about the violence that has been going on in our cities for the last handful of years and lots of finger pointing and lots of uh, excuse making and things of that nature. Um, but uh, but we want to get down to the root cause of it all, right? We want to know what's going on and why we're having this because the consequences are very, very serious. Lives are changed. Lives, lives are altered very drastically when it comes to violence, specifically gun violence. My guest today is Ken W. Good. Ken is uh, an attorney. He's uh, he's involved in so many things. He's a, a Texas bail attorney, a board member, a professional bondsman of Texas, and he's uh, here to share with us his take and perspective and knowledge on this uh, horrible gun crime. So, Ken, thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me, and thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. And this is really a great and important topic because there's so much that goes into the the whole issue of gun violence. As, as I said, it, it, people's lives are so drastically and dramatically impacted. There's consequences as far as what people want to do in regards to guns, gun control, and things like that. So let's let's far, first start and talk about you know what your passion is in in regards to gun crime and what you know. So we have a problem with gun crime. Tell us what that problem is, the increases in violent uh, gun crime. Well, you know, I think over the last few, it's a bigger issue than just gun crime itself. I think, you know, for the last five or six years, we've had uh, criminal justice reform, bail reform across the country, and especially focusing in our urban areas. Also, we've had uh, uh, pushes to defund the police, and we've had, uh, you know, belittling of the police and also, you know, calls for decriminalization. And we've also had some decriminalization uh, in California and other parts of the country where, you know, we've changed certain felonies to misdemeanors and then uh, prosecutors in our urban areas decide, well, since it's now a misdemeanor, we're not going to prosecute it anymore. And as a result, like in California, they've decriminalized theft under 950, or, you know, or under a certain amount of dollars. And that has had a devastating uh, consequence just by itself. You have uh, the message that it sends uh, to career criminals, gangs, and, and organized crime, because who's the one stepping into this void? That's who is. And so you have now you have stores closing in in those urban areas because they can't withstand twenty five thousand dollars in shoplifting every day, and then you've got uh, these pushes for other reasons, and and I think you have gun violence taking off, and I think that's a symptom of a larger problem, and I think the problem is that. We've, we've decided we're no longer going to hold people accountable in our urban areas and we've created such chaos and, and we don't now we don't even know how to get people through our criminal justice system because if you if you go back the problem that we're failing to address is how do we process people quickly and efficiently through the jail like you know there's a large county may may arrest around a thousand people a week well how do you process those process those people if you set up a procedure where you can't, like in Texas and Harris County, they've kind of just simply released people. New York tried that, and they've rolled back those reforms twice now because they were so devastating. And I think that the problem that we have is when we set up procedures and policies that become that create chaos, then we have our criminal element stepping into the void and taking advantage of it. And I think that's what you see in our urban areas across the country, and that's why you see crime just taking off uh, as a result. Yeah. So what's interesting about what you're saying, and, and it makes complete sense, is, is the, you know, you talk about decriminalizing theft and something like that. And someone may, might look at that and say, well, what does that have to do with gun crime? And I, you know, your point is, is that when we minimize, when we seem to take the side of criminals and go easy on them and make excuses for them and don't put them in jail and minimize their crimes so that we maybe don't even prosecute them. All that means is there are more criminals on the street, and those criminals are now naturally going to be bolder, right? I mean, that's essentially what happens in, in all this. Am I summarizing that right? Yes. When you don't hold people accountable, they see that as a green light to commit more crime. And so today's misdemeanors will be tomorrow's felons if we allow this to continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one, one of the things that you do talk about is there are uh, a number of cases of individuals, we know who they are and what they've done 
that were let out or or given you know ease you know quick easy sentences no bail that kind of thing and then they come out and they they commit murder or they commit you know a type of crime can you go over a couple of those cases to sort of put a name with it this isn't just you saying hey here's my hypothesis these are real real cases where people are murdering people but they should have been in jail well, you know, we have so many examples of this. It's really sad. Like, you know, in, in Harris County, we've got Crime Stoppers that is uh, compiling a list. And it's over 170 now of people who that were let out on a PR bond for murder. And then they committed another murder or let out on a very low bond or uh, and committed a murder. So it's, you know, it's to the point where Harris County is kind of being referred to as you get you know, the county where you get one free murder before you're, you know, you're thought of as being dangerous. And we have the example of the little old lady who was just went to Walgreens, 80 something year old grandma, just to get a, a birthday card for her grandson. And she's accosted in the parking lot, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning and killed by somebody who was out on two felony PR bonds and had been arrested 70 something times. In, in his past, and he was only 30 something years old. I mean, why somebody would, why some court would think that it would be great or a good idea to release somebody that's been arrested over 70 times on two free felony PR bonds is beyond me. And I think most of the people in the public would say that's beyond them. Why are we doing that? We're doing that because we've, cre they're doing that because we've created complete chaos. Uh, they can't, you know, the judges don't have time to figure out. And then we're setting up policies that are well intended. And the well intention is, well, we have to protect the poor. We have to make sure we don't take advantage of the poor. So it, as a result, we're tying the hands of judges so that they can't use their discretion to hold felons, career criminals, gang members, and we, you know, while we want to protect the poor, I think we would also agree that we want to hold career criminals, gang members, organized crime members. And the problem is, I think we're setting up policies that are tying the judges' hands in both situations, and that's what we have to stop. Yeah, and and there's a there's a, a couple of cases I think too. If you want to comment on these, a New York case uh, yes. where uh, where a man was stabbed to death um, by Thomas. Quillen, I think is his name, um, you know, and he, and, you know, his, he was out on, on bail reform due to bail reform. An 18 month old baby was killed by an individual that should have been in prison. So these are real cases. I mean, these are well, real and his first victims was John Lennon, John Lee. And what I would just point out is, you know, these are situations that historically people would not be given a free pass, a free bond. They would not be released on a low bond because historically we would, as a society, we've taken the stand that those are, are substantial crimes that warrant you being held. Um, but the politics now has gotten to the point where, uh, I mean, really it's just so political that it's almost like a test of your bona fides on whether you want them to be released or not uh, depending on which party you are. And that's where we're stuck right now. What, what's keeping true reform from passing is that we we have become so divided politically on this issue. And that's the reason why you see New York, when they when they uh, when the Democrats became in control of all of the government in New York, you know, uh, both the House, the Senate with uh, and, and the governor with um, large majorities, they came in and passed this humongous bell reform. Well, even Democrats have realized how bad it is and they've rolled it back on, on twice now, but it needs to be rolled back further. They're even talking about having a special session before the election to roll it back even further. That's not because they want to, that's because they're seeing the polls and they're saying we're keep fixing to get massacred if we don't do this. Now that's sad that the, the politics is pushing them to fix it we had to have all this damage when if you would just looked at it, we would have said, I mean, well, the bail industry was saying, if you do this, these will be the consequences. This will happen. Crime will increase. And, you know, they just like, oh, no, that's not true. And now that it's happened, it's like, oh, shock, 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 shock. Crimes increase. Well, go back to four years ago, two years ago. We said this was going to happen. And but, you know, uh, I hope that's 
one of the lessons here is we're not the enemy. What's good for the criminal justice system is good for the bail industry. Yeah, for, for certain. So it, is it fair to say, so when we think about some of these laws, you know, it's hard to say where they're all happening. Certainly in New York, we know in San Francisco, we, we had that, uh, we had that DA that was recalled and, and you get some of these, these, you know, Chicago, you get these large cities in which there's already large crimes anyways. It, it, could it take to hit these numbers? I, I think I saw a, a statistic just in a year, there was a 34% increase in on gun crimes just year over year and a 28% murder increase nationwide. Could it be easily said that five or six of our largest cities can be the ones responsible for this increase? Meaning, you know, my, my small town here has no increase in gun crime and most others don't, but just these large cities can create this in and of itself, right? Yeah, they are. And if you take out the largest cities, you know, the five, six largest cities in the country, then our, our, our gun violence, uh, we go way down uh, in our, our position. And, mm-hmm. and so it really is a, an issue that dates, I mean, that's focused on our uh, metropolitan areas. And, and I think there's multiple reasons for that. Number one, our, we have failed the inner cities in so many ways. We failed them in schools. We failed them in families. We failed them in job opportunities. And we've really failed them there in the last two years because we've had these protests or riots, whatever you want to call them. We've had businesses burned down. And at the time, you know, I remember them saying, oh, it's insured. Don't worry about it. It's just it's, it's just property damage. Well, no, the insurance companies don't pay for riots. And if, if they're paying off the claim, they're not rebuilding because it's not safe. The government doesn't have their back. And so what's hurting the inner cities even the most right now is they're losing their tax base. So the funds that they had last year for the very people that live in there, they have less this year unless they raise their taxes. And so it's become a spiral and it will continue to spiral and because it's going to get worse because we're going to have to have a backbone to make it better because you got to start sending a message. You're going to hold people accountable because when it starts spiraling out of control, then we have to give incentives for people we have to give them an incentive to come to court. And we give them the, the incentive for coming to court is we're going to discount your punishment. That's what they do in, you know, in uh, Chicago. You only get 10 years for murder because they got to give you an incentive to come so that they can get the case through the system. Harris County right now, they've got so much chaos that if you get arrested on misdemeanor, you never see a judge. You get released. You never go to court. And you got a 72% chance they'll dismiss your case. That was in 2021. And 2020. I mean, what? Is, I mean, why are we prosecuting crime? Why are we even having misdemeanor crime? Get rid of those courts. Save all that money. All we're doing is a paper shuffle and paying the criminal defense attorney. Yeah, oh, it's it's so messed up. And it, it, when, as you said in the beginning, when these things become col- political, everything gets distorted. And I mean, so it, it makes me a lot of the things that you were saying when you would talk about you were saying how they wanted to be reformed because we didn't want to you know, as a society hurt the poor, or I guess, you know, hurt minorities within the criminal justice system. But it occurs to me, but if we're talking about New York, San Francisco, Chicago, these are, these are largely, or at least have large black populations and and other minority populations, the crimes committed there, regardless of who's committing them, are more likely to be committed upon minorities and lower income people. So, you know, what is their thought process on how is this helping poor people and minorities? Well, I think that really reveals how political it's become because you're right, the very minorities that they're trying to help, that same group is disproportionately getting hurt by the increase in crime. But the dramatic increase in crime is disproportionately affecting them. And, you know, I, I disagree with the statement that, that, that uh, we incar- we have a, a racist criminal justice system. We have an inner city crime problem and the inner cities have a disproportionate number of minorities. Those are the victims of those crimes and those are the people committing those crimes. That's not racist. That's a location problem. The pe- Everybody that can afford to move out has moved out. The people that can't afford to move out is the the, those are the people that are committing the crime and those are the people they are committing crimes against. That's not a racist system. And and the problem is we kind of can't get to 
that issue because to, before we can get there, we have to overcome the yelling and we have to overcome groups. I mean, I was on a panel last week and it was supposed to be an analytical discussion about bail and how to reform it, how to make it work. And it was, you know, 10 people that came in, Black Lives Matter yelling about just there's too many, there's too many minorities in jail and, and, you know, and, and they're just irrational. They, they, I mean, I think that they're recruited because they're in there saying, well, we need to adopt the, the federal system and do preventative detention, either release or detain. And I'm like, you know, that's just a talking point. You don't realize that if we switch to a, a system where it's release or detain, more of those same minorities would be held than are being held right now because under preventative detention, we always hold more people. The f federal system, because it's political, the federal system uses that and seven, over 70% of the people arrested are detained uh, pre-trial. I mean, New Jersey changed to that kind of a system and initially 20% of the motions were granted. Now it's 40%. In a couple of years, it'll be 60 because that's what naturally happens. It becomes political. Uh, and that's the reason why we can't use it. I don't know about you, you know, your city or your state, Texas can't afford to detain 70% of the people arrested. And, and the worst thing about all this is the, natu the national compromise that's being proposed is kind of like what's going on in Harris County. We'll just give up on misdemeanor crime and concentrate on the really uh, dangerous, vicious felons. And I'm like, that is such a recipe for disaster because we're just creating a training ground. Today's misdemeanors will be tomorrow's felons, and, and we should... Uh, and we can predict it now if that's the compromise. Yeah. Well, what occurs to me too by all that you're saying is that when when we don't hold criminals accountable, especially early on, and like you said with misdemeanors, I'm not saying you know a, a first time offender misdemeanor throw him in jail for Absolutely. eight years, yeah. right? No, yeah. we don't want to ruin someone's life over something stupid. There are obviously lots of variables and circumstances involved. But when you don't hold people accountable, that's not good for them, right? I mean, it, it takes right. someone who maybe maybe if they were held accountable, they would turn their life around or at least have tried to say, hey, you know what? That wasn't fun. I'm going to do that again. But if you don't, you, you, as you said, you create career criminals almost. Well, historically, we've, you know, our criminal justice system is based upon the concept we impose just the amount of punishment to get you to change course. And so for a first time offender, it would not be much because we don't think it need, there's much uh, pressure that needs to be put on a first time offender. The problem is if you make it where we don't hold anybody accountable because as long as they're arrested on a misdemeanor, they get automatically released like in New York and they, they uh, uh, nobody's being a gatekeeper, nobody's looking at their criminal history. Well then it, okay, they see that as a green light. We are a country of second chances. But when the career criminal gets in there and, you know, we've had people in New York standing on the courthouse saying, I've been arrested 80 something times. I, I love bail reform. I mean, I'm, I'm all for a second. I'm all for a third chance. But I kind of start caught marking the line at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, I sure as heck draw the line at 20. And I sure I mean, I want to throw the book at you after that. I want to throw the book at you probably after four. But I mean, come on, at least when you're when you've got somebody that's been arrested 80 times and they're saying how great bail reform is, then we're not holding anybody accountable and we're telling them, go ahead, do what you want. We're not going to do anything to you. And they're seeing that. That's what the message they're receiving. And that's why you see Cadillac converter uh, theft just taking off across the country because we're not doing anything about it. And they and the uh, organized crime gangs have figured out a way to make a fortune off of it and so they're like yeah if the government can't provide a safe environment the criminal element would step in and figure out how to make money out of it so do you think that those that are for all this this reform and in bail reform all this do you think that they they truly believe that it will lead to a sort of more just society or do you th or do you think that they're just in it for politics, meaning, hey, let me let me do this because it'll it'll look good and it'll get me votes. I think that this is a result of a coalition, 
And I think there's different parts of the coalition. I think there's a part of the coalition that just is, you know, sunny sunshine. It's like, we, we want to give everybody a second chance. But I think there's a part of the coalition that does not believe that pe uh, poor people uh, should be prosecuted because they're they're poor. And so no matter how many times they get arrested, they shouldn't be prosecuted. We uh, And and there are elements of that coalition that want to create chaos. Uh, I don't know where Soros stayed, uh, falls in that, but he's probably financing a, a big yeah. amount of this. And I'm kind of starting to believe that he kind of goes into the wants to create chaos. Because if you can create chaos, then nope, there's no room for anybody because you don't have... If you've got a jail full of really dangerous people, well, then you've got to get rid of, of the misdemeanors because you have no room for them. And it's gonna. And if we're going to start holding people accountable, it's going to get worse. We're going to hold more people in jail because they got to realize, oh, my God, I got to change what I'm doing or I'm going to go to jail before it will get. So more people will be in jail before it gets better. Uh, and I don't know if we have the backbone for that right now, because if we even tried, there would be a chorus of your racist, a chorus of of you're just trying to take advantage of black people. We already have enough people in jail and we've got more people in jail in the United States than anybody else. And nobody comes back and says, where do you think the world sends their drugs? They send all their drugs to the United States. So of course we're going to have more people in jail. That's where all the drugs are coming. And, and if you want us just to give up on drugs, well then we're really going to give up on crime because most crime is some type of offshoot of the drug trade. And so we can't give up on, on crime. And so we can't give up on drugs. And so we're going to have to have grow a backbone and stand up to these people and say, we're going to do what's right. You can get on board or you can just go away because it doesn't seem like the compromise that they are willing to make is, is good for the uh, society or good for the criminal justice system. Yeah, none of it. None of it seems to be good. Uh, policies of the left are never, never good, and certainly never what they claim them to be. But, but I want to make a, a bit of a statement, and then just get your comments on it. This is my statement, not yours. My belief. You know, we 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 spent billions and billions of dollars overseas. We've recently spent. I I want to say the total amount of of money spent in Ukraine. And this isn't a discussion on Ukraine, but we've spent billions of dollars there. We're spending billions about, well, I mean, we're, we're, as a country, we're $30 trillion in debt. So we don't have a problem spending money. I'm not suggesting we spend more, but why is it that we can't have enough jails for these criminals and enough people in the in the ju criminal justice system to process them appropriately and you know worse if we can spend 40 billion dollars to a, send to a country that most people don't even know where it is why can't we spend this kind of money to protect the people of this country and of which that is the job of our government to protect our rights, those innocent people that are that are being killed or robbed or raped and their businesses destroyed or whatever the case may be, it's the job of government to protect them from that stuff. And it seems like they don't wanna spend the time, they don't wanna put forward the laws, they don't wanna enforce the laws, and they don't wanna spend the money as though they act like, well, we, we don't have the money. You know, I think we go through cycles. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that you learn, uh, you know, one of the things I learned was that, you know, we have to study history so that we won't repeat the same mistakes. And if you don't study history, then you will repeat the same mistakes. And I think we're in the process of repeating some mistakes from the 60s. You know, I think building jails, building new jails, building additional jails is very political. And, you know, it's a coalition, you know, there's even people on the right that don't want to spend the money to, for, to build a jail because they're fiscal conservatives. And so all you got to do is defeat a jail proposition. And then that puts pressure downward to do bail reform or some criminal justice reform. So the coalition is always moving. But when you get a coalition to defeat a, a jail proposition and, you know, here's my position. I've got several really probably very strong positions and a lot of people disagree with me, but as long as crime's going up, we don't have enough jail space because you're going to have to have more people in jail. And until crime's going down, you don't have enough people in jail because they're seeing that, that they can make, take advantage of it. And they, they're uh, making money off of it. The organized crime is the other thing I would say is, you know, if the government 
either through defunding the police or or just not having enough police. If they can't protect you and they can't protect me, well, then they they should naturally give me the tools or allow me the tools to protect myself. It's just pure logic. I mean, it, it really offended me in the last year when some police department's response was, you know, we're having a rash of break-ins, house, house break-ins, people storming homes. And their response is, you should give them whatever you want. We can't protect you, so you should give them whatever you want. And I'm like, you know, y'all need, you know, the criminals need to come to Texas. You know, you if you decriminalize theft and, you know, fine. But in Texas, we have what call, what's called the Castle Doctrine. And that means I can defend my castle. I can defend my house with lethal force. And so it just has set up this all huge irony in our urban areas. You get, you won't get prosecuted for breaking my house to steal something, but I won't get prosecuted for shooting and killing you if I catch you. That's ludicrous. We shouldn't have that system. And the reason why we have it in Texas and our progressive areas is because of this stupid politics that we have going on. These are not, you know, this is not about what's best for the criminal justice system. This is not what's best for those minorities living there. This is a about the next election. If you think about it, we've had cycle after cycle where six months before an election, we had something happen, we'd have huge protests, and we would have one side getting angry. And and then they're, they're Politician would say, come out and vote and vote this way. And they would come out. And then after the election, they'd get a little bit more mad because they didn't get what they wanted. It was all rhetoric. And so they started electing the true believers that get, would try to give them what the other people had always promised. Well, they promised it because it was not a good policy. But it just was po politics. And now we're seeing the consequences of that unleashing that mob and unable to control it. And we're seeing those policies that were just rhetoric being put into place and we're reaping the rewards and which are not rewards. We're re reaping the havoc of those policies and we're having to try to figure out how to, how to uh, survive with rising crime as a result. And you're going to see more and more rollbacks. Hawa uh, uh, Alaska, they adopted these policies. They didn't work. They rolled them back. You got uh, Alaska. They passed it. And then the, it was such an uproar. The governor uh, vetoed it even in Alaska. I mean, even in Hawaii, you know how progressive that is. And so if it's enough is enough is enough in Hawaii, well, then that tells you why we have the president of the United States coming out yesterday uh, in the last couple of days saying, oh, we stand for uh, the police. We want to fully fund the police. Uh, yeah, we've got an election less less, less than 90 days. Uh, it sounds like to me this is all political. And it sounds like the internal polls are telling you that crime is going to be one of the top, if not the top three issues of this election cycle. And you are scared to death of what the polls are telling you. And you should be. And shame on you for what you've done to our, our urban areas. Yeah, so they say defund the police, defund the police, criminal justice reform. Uh, they say that for you know a year and a half or more, and then suddenly, as you said, right before an election, they say fund the police. I saw that too, and I and I was like, these people not think we have memories. Uh, this is crazy. So hey, Ken, this is really really interesting, great stuff, and in in a super important topic. It is very important because, as I said in the beginning, it affects people's lives so dramatically and so sadly, and it's so unnecessary. It, there, 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 there's not like it's a mystery on how to deal with this properly. We know. So how can people learn more about this, connect with you, maybe have you come and speak um, in an event that they might have regarding this topic? You know, what would be the best way to reach you? Uh, the best way is to go to our website, pbtx.com. Um, we have a, a media tab, so you can contact uh, contact our media representatives. But we also have a blog on there where we highlight important news, but we also have our own podcast called The Bell Post. You can go there and there's a link to it or you can go to thebellpost.com. You can, we do uh, posts all the time or we do episodes on our podcast just teaching people what different aspects of the criminal justice reform, bell reform are. Our most recent episode that we just did Saturday was talking about what is the New Jersey plan because we have a politician in Texas who wants to abolish bondsmen and adopt the New Jersey plan. And so we don't know what, you know, just so we have we can educate our legislators on what that is and what that means and how expensive that would be. 
um, we did a podcast about it. And so we've had judges, we've had sheriffs, we've had uh, other bondsmen, of course, uh, but we're building a very good library of, of, of issues to educate people on, on these criminal justice issues. And I would invite anybody to come. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. If you, if this is a topic you're interested in, or again, having uh, Ken uh, come and speak and, and check him out. So Ken, Ken Good, thank you so much for uh, the great information, the great discussion, and uh, thanks so much for all you're doing. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it very much. Absolutely. My pleasure. And thank all of you for listening to this episode of Fides Podcast with Ken Good. Uh, please check out all my different podcasts and all the different podcast apps on YouTube, on Rumble, and on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on rightamericamedia.com. So thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Forever.